hear God's word as it comes from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. This story occurs just after the mountaintop experience of the transfiguration when Jesus and his three disciples go down into the valley. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciple asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. May God bless this reading of his holy word. My son has never heard my voice. He has never said, Daddy. He has never said his own name. He lives in a world of silence and isolation. I could handle that. So could he. But there's more. The infernal thing within him makes him dance like a marionette. It tosses him like a rag doll. It reduces him to a rabid dog. And then there are the convulsions. It's all my wife and I can do to protect him from himself. We dodge his flailing arms and legs and try to get him to a a safe and comfortable position. Watch his head. Oh, he's hurting me. Let him down easy. Hold him close. Make him comfortable. Don't let him fall. I know we did things wrong over the years. There was a time we were by a, a lake and the diseased drove him to jump in the water. It was all I could do to keep him from drowning by holding him above the surface. And then there was the fire. He fell into the flames, scalded by the boiling water, scarred. Have you seen the scars on his arms and legs and chest? The searing coals burned him. Our neighbors saw them. They didn't say a word. They just looked at us, and I knew what they were thinking. How could I explain to them that it was the disease that did this, not us? We just resolved to keep him in our house, away from others. I am walking through the valley of the shadow of doubt. My friends... Give me pious advice. God will never give you more than you can handle. How can that be? I can't control his 
convulsions. I can't handle this. God, if you gave this to us, I can't handle it. You chose the wrong person. I can't do it. Oh, we tried. We went to every doctor to find help, local practitioners and city specialists, herbalists and counselors, faith healers, fortune tellers. They all had different suggestions and advice on what to do. Strap him down. Just let him go free. Hide him in your house. Send him away. Rub this on him. Give this to him three times a day. Change his diet. They all made these suggestions. None of it made any difference. God helps those who help themselves, our local village priest said. I wanted to give up, but I kept trying in the hopes that God, after I did my part, would come in and do his part, but he... He just never seemed to show up. We always kept going. More doctors, more faith healers, more alternative medicines. None of it made any difference. If, if God only helps me when I help myself, I said to my priest, why do I need God's help? He just looked at me wordlessly. Take your son to Rabbi Jesus, the carpenter. He'll heal him, my neighbor told me. I'd heard about this Jesus. He was, uh, I don't know, I thought maybe he was just one more of those faith healers that had left the carpenter shop to go preaching, some kind of mystic that went around. Some said he's Messiah. Others said he's the devil or one of his demons. I didn't really care. I just wanted him to heal my son. Journeys can be so excruciating. I mean, sometimes my boy comes along quietly, but there are times when he just is attacked and the convulsions take over, and all we can do is try to keep him comfortable and wait until it passes. Well, on this journey, it just seemed like it was getting harder and harder. The resistance was building the closer we came. And then finally, finally, it was excruciating, it was agony, but we arrived. There was a whole mass of Jesus' followers there. My relief, though, was shattered when I discovered the carpenter. He wasn't, he wasn't there somewhere else. His disciples, they, they did a little service. They quoted his words, they explained them, they sang a few psalms, and it was kind of a mixed crowd, long-bearded teachers of the law, uh, outfitted in robes befitting their authority, sitting over on the side in a tight little group with skeptical looks on their faces. There were merchants and laborers and farmers and peasants, ladies of the evening. There were traitorous tax collectors, foreigners from up north, And there was even a contingent of Roman legionnaires kind of keeping an eye on the crowd. But in the middle, right in the middle, there were the people who were hopeful. I saw people that were blind and bandaged, deaf and mute. Some hobbled on crutches. Others were carried on mats. Lepers. They all were there in the middle. They had the special place in the center, not because the crowd was compassionate, but because they wanted to keep their distance from these unclean wretches. And then finally, when the service was done, the disciples, they said, all right, all who want to be healed, come forward. If you believe, all will be well. It took hours. For a long time, I felt like we were a tiny point in a swirling sea of human misery. We waited and waited and waited, and during that time, my son, he had two convulsions, and people were frightened and afraid. He would fall on the ground, roll in the dust, spray me with spit, and they all backed off and said, he has a demon. I said, no, no, he doesn't. But I I have to confess it in my soul. I have believed it myself. 
Finally, we started to move forward in waves towards the disciples. And the closer we got, it seemed the more he resisted. I looked forward and I could see. I kept my eyes on the goal because there up ahead there were miracles. Crutches thrown aside. Paralyzed people standing up and carrying their mats. Bandages unraveled. Blind people blinking in the sunlight. Lepers feeling their baby's soft skin. It seemed like forever, but finally it was our turn and the disciples were about to ask me, what is wrong with your boy when suddenly he had a horrible convulsion? And so they put their hands on him and they said, be healed. But nothing happened. He kept rolling. Be healed. He still was riling in the dust. Be healed. Come out of him, you demon. And nothing happened. And that ignited a firestorm. The priests who had been sitting on the side watching this whole thing came and pounced and said, you failed. This whole thing is a farce, a, a fake. You've set all these people up and fooled them. No, no, they disciples said, look at the others. The others were healed. Look at them. They're real miracles. Ask them. No, no, they're just actors and performers. You're making the people be fooled by all of your tricks. And they said, no, no, it's not our fault. These are real healings. It's not our fault. It's his fault. He doesn't believe. And he pointed his finger and he pointed it at me. Your faith is weak, the disciples said. You don't believe. And suddenly every eye and every angry face turned towards me, and I was in the deepest valley of the shadow of doubt. Did I believe? Is it my fault? Is my son's illness because I'm not, I don't have a strong enough faith? I, I don't know. Do you believe, they asked me. I stammered, I, 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 but before I could answer, there was a commotion at the back of the crowd. Someone called out, the teacher is here. And the sea of humanity parted like Moses going through the sea. And suddenly I stood face to face with him. He had simple, soiled, homespun cloth clothing, but in him I could sense a commanding presence, an authority. What are you arguing with them about, he asked the disciples. Embarrassed, they just looked shamefaced down. So I summoned up my courage, and I said to him, Teacher, I brought my son to you who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. At times, it, it tosses him into the fire, into the water. It convulses him. Your disciples couldn't heal him. When the words came out of my mouth, I, I thought I had wounded him because he lifted up his head and he said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how much longer must I be with you? How long must I stay with you? And I thought he was talking about me, but then I realized when I looked over at the disciples, he was referring to them and to their lack of faith. Bring the boy to me, he said. And now erupted the strongest attack I had ever seen. Everyone else drew back. Disciples, crowd, teachers, they all fell away. But not Jesus. Very calmly, he said to me, how long has he been like this? And I started to pour out the whole same sad story I'd told all those doctors all those years. From childhood, I went through every detail, and finally I said, if you can do anything, please have mercy on us and help us. But my words, I wanted to draw them back because I noticed he looked at me, arched his eyebrow, and said, if you can do anything, everything is possible. For the one who believes. Now there was a convulsion which ripped through my soul. Do I believe so many lost hopes, so many 
unanswered prayers, so many frustrating attempts, so many long journeys through the dark valley of doubt. And all people ever gave me were all these cliches. God helps those who help themselves. I'm helpless. God will never give you more than anything I can, you can handle. I, I can't handle this. All will be well if you believe. I believed and nothing worked out. And now this man said to me, everything is possible for those who believe. Was this one more empty, pious cliche? I mean, he wasn't even promising anything. He just said it was possible. He wasn't giving me a guarantee or an assurance. He was just asking me, do do you believe? Not do you believe there is a God. Not do you believe stuff about God. But do you believe God? Do you believe God can heal him? And do you believe God, even if he doesn't heal him, do you still trust him? I didn't know what to say. And finally he said, I, I do believe, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I believe God can heal him. Help me trust him. And with that, Jesus turned to my boy and said, come out of him, you deaf and mute spirit, and never enter him again. And for the first time, I heard my son's voice. It was a horrid shriek that seemed like it came from the very depths of hell. His body arched upwards once, twice, and then he fell to the ground, motionless, lifeless. And for 60 terrible seconds, he lay there, and everyone around said, whispered, he's dead. No! I fell in the dust beside my son's corpse and soaked the ground with my sobbing. It was over. The whole long nightmare was over. What good is faith? It didn't help him. He's dead. And then I heard a muffled, halting sound that seemed like it was trying to make sounds for the very first time. Daddy. I opened up my eyes, and through watery eyes, I could see my son standing next to Jesus, whole, healthy, and free. Everything is possible, Jesus said, for those who believe. I fell in the dust beside my son's corpse and soaked the ground with my sobbing. It was over. The whole terrible nightmare was over. What good is faith? It didn't save him. He's dead. Then Jesus touched my shoulder, and I looked in his eyes, and he said, Remember, everything is possible for the one who believes. Your son is not lost. He's safe in my father's house. Trust me. I buried my son on a little hill in the town cemetery up overlooking our village. Sometimes I go up there and sit beside him and talk to him and talk to God. It comforts me to know he's at peace. That's where I was when my neighbor told me the news. Hey, um, you know that rabbi, Jesus, that you took your son to who didn't heal him? Yeah. I just heard that he was crucified in Jerusalem. I swallowed hard and looked down at my boy. So I guess I said, everyone ran away and left him. The disciples, they scattered. They said, no, that's actually the strange thing about him, my neighbor said. His disciples say he rose from the grave and that his death opened the door to his father's house. His father's house. It hit me, a ripple of memory, that phrase, his father's house. 
Yeah, he said, that he opened the door to his father's house for all who believe. I looked at my son's grave. Everything is possible if you believe. I fell at the ground beside my son's corpse and soaked the ground with my sobbing. It was over. The whole terrible nightmare was over. What good is faith? It didn't save him. He's dead. And then Jesus touched my shoulder, and I looked up, and there was my son, alive, breathing. I could tell he had a slight tremor. Jesus said to me, This kind can only come out through prayer. Keep praying. Everything is possible for those who believe. I took my son home. He still has the attacks. They seem less, though. At least they do to me. He seems to be doing better. I pray now because I'm still helpless when it comes to his attacks, but I pray, and now I ask God to give me strength to trust him to do what I can to help. I try to remember that everything is possible. Jesus didn't heal him, at least not the way I wanted. Jesus actually healed me. He helped me to trust in God and believe God, even when things don't go my way. And so when I walk through the valley of the shadow of doubt, I have no fear because he is with me. And that's all I need. Let's pray. We come to you, Jesus, with our doubts, struggles, things in our lives that are beyond our control. But we believe that nothing is beyond your control. Help us, even in our doubts, to trust you and believe. Thank you for this sacrament, which reminds us of the great price you paid to draw us in, to give us strength, to lead us through our darkness into your light. Be with each person here, Lord. Help us to know that we don't have to bear our struggles alone because we have you. We pray this in your strong name. Amen.